Today, the DFA Financial Pressure Reports for May 2024, Part 1, The Overview. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I've made this post covering finance and property news. Well, today I'm going to start a series on the results from our surveys to the end of May 2024. Traditionally, I've tried to cover this in one live show, but it's always a rush and I never get into the detail that I think it warrants. So this time around, I'm going to try something different. I'm actually going to break it into pieces and cover each of the elements in separate shows. And in fact, the last show is one where if you put your requests in, we can then look at individual postcode results. This, of course, is a traditional part of what I've done on the live stream. So to give you a bit of a feeling of how this works in practice, we're going to start with the overview of the May results, which is this show. The next show then is on mortgage stress. So looking at those with owner occupied mortgages in particular. The show after that will be covering the rental stress stories and we'll be able to look at both the high level, but more importantly, the mapping and the detail behind the rental stress story too. And then we go into the investor stress area. There's a lot to talk about there, particularly with regard to the gross and net yields on investment property. And incidentally, we'll also look at the mapping of that too. And then we're going to look at the overall summation of stress into the financial stress. And financial stress essentially gives us a view of the aggregated story when we take mortgage stress, rental stress, investor stress, and overall financial stress into account. So that'll be an important conversation. And then the final part will be the postcode analysis and responding to viewers' requests. So if you have a particular postcode that you would like me to look at in that final show, put it in the comments below, and I'll then pick it up and collate it over the next few days and incorporate it in the final show of the series. Now, to start the story off, it's probably worth just understanding that there is a very simple story here at one level but is also determined a little bit by how we measure stress in the first place. And you'll be aware that I have a particular mechanism that I use to be able to measure it in a very particular way. The cornerstone of this, of course, is our core market model, where we survey households on a rolling basis. We have 52,000 in there at any one time, and that allows us then to analyze what's going on. The inputs are added in weekly, and we roll the data at the end of each month, and the results are published uh, in the subsequent few days of the following month. We can slice and dice the data in different ways, including looking at things like the segment that a particular household is in, the location, and other issues too. It's like a Rubik's Cube. And as well as that, we can also then form a view about where the scenarios may take us, scenarios being a view of where the future may lay with regard to what may happen to both house prices and also rentals and also, of course, defaults. And standing back, if you take the mortgage stress data from our surveys, the price trajectory of the history, also the buying and selling intentions, the migration and the broader economic information, all of that goes into the core market model and fire our scenarios. We can then calculate at a postcode and also roll up to a region, state, and all Australian level, what's going on. And by the way, I will just remind you that we are still running our DFA one-to-one -one service. This is actually something where you can have an individual conversational discussion with me about a particular suburb. This isn't financial advice, but we can look at the underlying trends, and that includes things like the stress data, the home price trend data, and also form a view as to where prices may head in the future based on our scenarios. It's an hour's conversation, and we can do that via Zoom or by phone. And if you'd be interested in doing that, there's a cost involved, and uh, that's because there's a lot of work involved in doing that. But you can contact me by the DFA blog, and we can book something we're booking three to five weeks ahead at the moment. We're having lots of conversations because there are quite a few people out there who value an objective, independent view of what's actually going on. 
Now let's talk about the different definitions of stress. There are lots of different ones out there. Some people are using 30% of income or maybe taxable income. Others are using underwriting metrics of various sorts, but we define stress simply in cash flow terms, money in, money out. So if households have more outgoings, excluding one-off discretionary items and income, we define them as stressed. If they have a mortgage, then they're in mortgage stress. If they're renting, then they've got rental stress. Investors with cash flow pressures are identified as stressed investors, and we can aggregate the data to estimate total financial stress. And we can report it at a percentage of households and also at account level at a particular postcode. Now, in many ways, I think the latter is a better measure because it's the rule of big numbers. But in these conversations, we will also cover some of the percentage data too. The RBA published a report quite recently talking about the spectrum of household financial stress. It was quite helpful, really, because they say at one end you've got mild stress, and that's all about budget pressures and prioritizing spending. But as intensity gets worse, then you can end up missing payments. And the worst case, the more severe end, is where you default or go insolvent. Now, when I measure stress, I'm actually measuring it at the mild end. So if people have cash flow pressures and they are effectively having to prioritize, we regard them as stressed. But I also make the point that in this particular analysis, we will also be able to look at the story of defaults, because that's an alternative view, and the default numbers are actually quite important as well. Now, just as I go into this, it's worth noting that Roy Morgan's latest analysis, which is until the end of April, they say that 30.8% of owner-occupied mortgage holders have mortgage stress on their definition, which is not the same as mine. They tend to use a more underwriting perspective. This is a pretty high number, and that translates to 1.56 plus million households in mortgage stress. Bear that number in mind when you see my results. And they also run a scenario forward that if things go worse beyond, then effectively a higher number could be impacted. The 30.8%, by the way, is a little lower than the worst of the global financial crisis at 35.6%. But of course, the absolute number at 1.56 million is higher than it's ever been. And while we're talking about Roy Morgan, it's worth just noting that the consumer confidence, as reported this week, fell 1.8 points again. And it's interesting that the confidence has fallen back now to a low of 80.2 points. It's running modestly higher than the serious average of 78 points in 2023, but it's more than 30 points below the long range average. And household confidence declined. Short term economic confidence is now at its lowest level for the whole of 2024. And households are also more wary than 12 months about their own finances. And so that sub index is falling as well. This is all no surprise. We're seeing it in our data as well. But it is quite interesting to get some independent triangulation of just how difficult stress is for many households. And there's another piece of data which is worth sharing at this point. It actually relates to the credit card story. And this information came out quite recently just to show that the credit card outstandings are rising quite considerably. And in fact, you can see there since 2021, there's been a significant rise. More people are putting more on credit cards. And also APRA reported that defaults are rising again. They're still quite low, but are rising. And those are two leading indicators of potential trouble ahead. Now it's time to look at the stress data from our models to the end of May 2024. First thing to observe is that we see another significant spike up in rental stress. At the end of May 2024, 77.09% of those renting have cash flow pressures. And you can see there the long term trend up from a very small proportion back in the year 2000 up to a very high level now, when in fact it's as high as it's ever been. And unfortunately, given the most recent inflation data, which is also showing that rents continue to rise at above 7%, we expect stress to maintain its trajectory higher ahead. We can look at mortgage stress. We can also see that that is higher too. And in fact, in May, it was at 51.3% of all borrowing households. 
for unoccupied mortgages. And by comparison, back in February 2020, it was 32.9%. So it continues to rise. Again, no surprise, but it is worrying to see that trend. More than half of households with unoccupied mortgages are struggling with their cash flows. And finally, it's also worth noting that the RBA continues to report relatively high debt to income ratios at 185.3, although, of course, this is slightly warped because it includes all households, whether they have a mortgage or not, and also some small business data too, the better number would probably be to multiply it by three times, which would give us a debt-to-income ratio of five to six times. And we know that quite a few households are actually touching closer to six, seven or eight times, particularly recent first-time buyers. Now, if we look at the detail for May... We can see there that we have data for each of the states broken down by the mortgage stress, the rental stress, the stressed investors and the financial stress. And we also show the percentage. Now, the percentages are of those who have borrowing for mortgage stress, those renting for rental stress, those with investment property for the investor stress and overall financial stress against all households. And you can see there in yellow where the numbers have increased in percentage terms relative to last month. So in the ACT, in New South Wales, in Queensland, in South Australia, in Tasmania, Victoria, and overall, mortgage stress is higher. It did ease back slightly in the Northern Territory, although that's a very small number, so the sampling is always a bit more volatile there. And in Western Australia, it was down to 52.06%. And just to give you some sense of what that really means, if you take the ACT, for example, there's around 31,800 households in mortgage stress. In New South Wales, it's 540,000. In Victoria, it's 526,000. In Queensland, 329,000. In Western Australia, 223,000. And overall, that's more than 1.86 million households. So that's a bigger number than the Roy Morgan one when they said 1.5 plus. 1.86 is our estimate, but we're measuring it differently in cash flow terms. Turning to rental stress, you can see that rental stress is slightly in the ACT and in Tasmania, but rose in New South Wales, the NT, Queensland, South Australia, Victoria, Western Australia, and across the whole of Australia at 77.08%. And again, looking at the numbers, in the ACT, there is around 44,000 households there in rental stress, 862,000 in New South Wales, just 10,000 in the Northern Territory, 504,000 in Queensland, 150,000 in South Australia, 43,000 in Tasmania, 565,000 in Victoria, and 206,200 in Western Australia. And that gives a grand total of more than 2.38 million households in rental stress across the country. That is unfortunately another record. Turning to investor stress, we can see there again that stress was higher for investors in the ACT at 26%, in the Northern Territory at 10.9%, in South Australia at 16.5%, in Tasmania at 18.9%, in Victoria at 21.6%, but it was lower in New South Wales at 26.88%, lower in Queensland at 21.91%, and also Western Australia at 20.61, and in aggregate, it is back to 22.91%. In terms of numbers, there are about 16,000 stressed investors in the ACT, 251,000 in New South Wales, 131,000 in Queensland, and 157,000 in Victoria, 62,000 in Western Australia, and that gives a grand total of stressed investors at 664,000. And I want to highlight that the 157,000 in Victoria is one of the reasons why we're seeing quite high levels of listings of property in Victoria, as more investors who are stressed, in other words, their cash flows don't cover the costs of the investment property and little prospect of cattle appreciation, so they're trying to sell. And the final story here is the financial stress. And in fact, that's the aggregate of mortgage stress, rental stress and investor stress. And every state saw a rise in financial stress in May. Overall, the numbers are pretty eye-watering at 50.38%, 
and that's more than 4.9 million households in financial stress. 1.6 million in New South Wales, 1.2 million in Victoria, 965,000 in Queensland, 492,000 in Western Australia, 333,000 in South Australia, and the smaller numbers, ACT 92,000, the Northern Territory 21,000, and Tasmania 104,000. Financial stress, of course, means that they will have cash flow pressures, whether they have a mortgage or renting or have an investment property or some combination of all of those. And that number at 4.9 million is another new record. Now, we can also slice the data differently, looking at the different household segments. And this time, the yellow highlights are just showing the big numbers. It's not showing the relative move from last month. But you can see there that the young growing families, disadvantaged fringe and battling urban segments have the highest amount of mortgage stress. Young growing families include many first time buyers. The battling urban disadvantaged fringe include some first time buyers, but also some people who bought earlier on, often with home and land packages are in difficulty. But you can see there that all segments have some degree of impact and it's not equally spread across all the different segments. Turning to rental stress, rental stress actually is more evenly distributed across the segments. Interestingly, we see the multicultural establishment group at 85.4%, the most stressed. These are the first generation Australians who have come into the country and gone straight into the rental sector. But we're also seeing mature stable families and wealthy seniors and young affluents and young growing families all wrestling with rental stress, as well as those on the urban fringe and those in the disadvantaged areas of the country too. And even exclusive professionals and suburban mainstream groups are also caught up in this as well. Now, if we look at investor stress, it's concentrated amongst those who have multiple investment properties. That includes young affluent households at 43% and exclusive professionals the more affluent household at 36%. They tend to have several investment properties. And it's interesting to note that young affluents have higher degrees of investor stress because they are less adept at buying the right properties for investment purposes, whereas its exclusive professionals have tended to be at it longer and have a better portfolio of properties. Overall, about 22% are in stress here, as we've discussed earlier. So it does vary across the different groups, but of course, there are less investors amongst the battling urban than disadvantaged fringe and amongst rural families. So no surprise that those counts are lower. And finally, then, if we look at the financial stress, again, we can see that young growing families lead out at 70 percent. That's more than 515,000 young growing families, including many first time buyers who have significant difficulty. A lot of those, of course, are also in the rental sector, as we discussed. So it is quite broadly spread. And then we can also see that in the next groups, young affluents are showing up. The battling urban, the disadvantaged fringe, the multicultural establishment. And in fact, pretty much all segments do have significant pressures. So one of the takeaways from here is that we shouldn't be thinking that mortgage stress or rental stress or investor stress is sticky just to one type of segment. It's very broadly spread across the country. And as we'll see shortly, a lot of this is to do with geographic location as well. Now, there's one other way of looking at it, and that is the estimate of defaults over the next 12 months. Now, this is based on my modeling, and it's taking information from today and projecting forward what may well be happening. And so in this table, you can see that we're showing the number of households across each of the states and roughly 9.7 million households showing up across the country, with, of course, the largest number in New South Wales, over 3 million, Victoria at more than two and a half million, Queensland at 1.9 million and Western Australia at just over a million. Then we can see where the borrowing is sitting as well. And once again, New South Wales and Victoria has the bulk of borrowing, but of course, we also see a lot in Queensland and also Western Australia. So now if we look at the risk of default, this 
shows you the count of households in each state that risk default over the next 12 months. New South Wales leads out at 30,000, Victoria at 28,000, Queensland at 24,000 and Western Australia at 17,000. And there are more than 113 households at risk of default based on our analysis. In terms of percentages, New South Wales at 2.9, Victoria at 2.7, Western Australia at 2.7 and South Australia at 2.9 lead out. But Queensland is the highest at 3% and the national average is 2.7%, which translates to 113,000 households. Now these are updated each month and each time we do it, we see slightly higher levels going forward. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about is the scenarios. The scenarios are effectively a way of trying to understand what's going on. And in fact, think of it as not a forecast, but to show sensitivities and how things may play out. None of these scenarios may be right. Things change. But we use a framework driven from our core market model, as we discussed, and we always look at three potential outcomes updated with the latest data and results. And the scenarios run from today forwards. So if we look at each scenario, the best is the Goldilocks zone, where rates stay at 4.35%. They fall through late 24. Inflation eases ahead of RBA expectations. Wages rises quite strongly. There's no recession in Australia. Migration remains above average. So demand's very strong. Interest rates don't actually put more pressure on households. And eventually, we actually see rate cuts. The second scenario is the soft landing scenario, where rates stay at 4.35% through 24, while inflation falls, but then rises again. In fact, we saw some earlier signs of this in the latest monthly inflation data that came out recently. And inflation stays above target until well into 2025. We don't get a recession in Australia, but those rates are higher for longer, and that puts more pressure on households. Migration does fall a bit. And the worst case scenario, the nightmare scenario, is where rates go higher than 4.35%, giving mortgage rates at 7.25% plus, and they stay high through the whole 24, along with inflation, unemployment rises, wages growth stalls due to a recession locally. Rates fall later and migration drops, but the damage is done and we have a recession locally. So here we have the scenarios for home prices based on the three scenarios. In the best case scenario, over the next three years, home prices on average across the country could be 9.4% higher over the next three years and 3.7% higher over the next 12 months on average. In the base case, there's a fall of 9% over three years and a couple of percent over the next 12 months. And the worst case for houses, down 29% with 7% over the next 12 months. Units tend to follow but perhaps don't drop quite as much. The worst case scenario for units would be a fall of 25% over the next three years and 6% over the next 12 months. Now we can also look at individual states. So in Western Australia, where of course markets are quite buoyant at the moment, best case scenario is a rise of 21% over the next three years with potentially 12 months worth at 7.8%. The base case is a rise of 2.4%. 1.9% of that will be in the next 12 months, and then it eases back. And the worst case will be a fall of 17% over three years and a fall of 3% over the next 12 months. Units follow suit, although the scenarios are slightly different, with the units up 18.5% over three years, best case scenario, and down 15.3% over three years, worst case scenario. Here's the Queensland story. Again, it's quite buoyant in Queensland. So a three-year best case scenario at 15.4% and 5.8% over 12 months. The base case down 3.6% over the next three years and pretty much flat over the next 12 months. And the worst case scenario down 23% over three years and down 5% over 12 months. Units again following quite closely, although the worst case scenario is a smaller fall of 20.5% over three years and down 4.6% over 12 months. In terms of New South Wales, where prices are not as strong, 
there's a 7.7% rise, best case scenario, over three years with 3.3% over the next 12 months. The base case is a fall of 11% over three years or 2.6% over 12 months. And the worst case is down 31.3% and 7.8% over the next 12 months. And looking at units, the best case scenario, pretty close. The worst case scenario, a smaller fall at 27% over three months, at 27% over three years and 6.8% down over the next 12 months. And in Tasmania, where of course markets are already pretty weak, even the best case scenario is pretty much flat. The base case is a fall of 18.7% over three years and 6.3% down over 12 months. The worst case down 38% and down 11% over the next 12 months. Units following quite closely, although the fall is somewhat lower, with the three year worst case scenario down 33% over three years and down 10% over 12 months. And in Victoria, again, a weak market down. 1.1% over the next three years, best case scenario, the base case down 20% and down 5% over the next 12 months. And the worst case scenario down 40% and down 10% over the next 12 months. Units following quite closely, but don't fall quite as much with the worst case scenario down 34% over three years and down 9.1% over 12 months. And I will just make the point that different segments have different profiles. This is the young growing family segment. So the best case scenario over the next three years is an average rise of about 3.5% best case, base case down 15% for houses and 35% for houses, worst case scenario. And looking at units, very similar, although the drop is a little less. And over three years, worst case scenario down 30% and down 8.2% over the next 12 months. So that pretty much gets us towards the end of the first show. I do have, of course, very detailed information at the postcode level. Here's just a sample. This is my classic example of the postcode 2500, which is the Wollongong area. And in this particular extract, we can actually represent a lot of information, including the counts, the stress levels, the distribution of households, and also the scenarios all on one page. So that information is available. If you are interested in getting an up-to-date sample of a particular postcode, then put the postcode in the comments below and I'll try and accommodate you over the next few days. Also, if I don't manage to do it on the show and you want a particular postcode, you can always contact me via the DFA blog and I will send you the one page summary, no charge. So as I come to the end of the show, I want to make just a couple of closing remarks, as I often do, because what I believe to be true is that mortgage stress and rental stress and more broadly financial stress isn't going away anytime soon. The latest information suggests that rates will be higher for longer. The expectation is it will remain strong. And what that means is that households are going to have to find their own way through some of these traps. In fact, less than half of households really understand what's going on with their cash flow. So one of the things that I often say to people in my one-to-ones is it's worth understanding where the money is coming in and where it's going out so you can prioritize. And there are some tools available. The ASIC website, Smart Money, has some quite good tools and I'll show you another one shortly. Now, of course, if you do actually end up with cash flow pressure, it's really important to talk to your lender and there are rules and regulations in place for lenders to try and assist, although a recent report suggests that many people who talk to their lenders don't necessarily get the good help that they want. And quite often what the lenders are doing is providing support which works for them, but not necessarily for the borrower, and it may just postpone the inevitable. In fact, there are more households now being encouraged to sell their properties, and we'd expect more of that. One of my general observations is it's really good to get a bit of advice on this. And it's very important not just to Google. Quite often you'll end up on the site where they want you to pay a fee and you shouldn't need to do that to get some basic advice to be able to work out what to do. The one I recommend is the National Debt Helpline 1-800-007-007. This is a very important source of information and I do recommend picking up the phone and talking to a financial counsellor there, or you can contact them via live chat, of course. They do have 
a lot of different ideas about how to deal with it. And uh, it's worth saying, of course, that all the debt councillors are very, very busy at the moment. There's a significant overhang of people struggling to figure out what to do. And whilst people may be working multiple jobs and trying to hunker down, the longer the high interest rates go on, the more rents go up, the more mortgage payments are actually eroding savings, the less of a chance of getting out scot-free there is. So get some advice if you need it. I do recommend that. And talking of advice, there's also the statement of financial advice information. This is actually quite helpful. I noticed this coming up quite recently. The AFCA's website has a statement of financial position, and it's a structured form that allows you to fill out things like your borrowing details, your household income, the living expenses, details of the property, other assets, the debts you have, and also begin to shape a proposal about how to deal with it. And once you've done that, you've got a form that gives you a really good point of leverage to have a conversation with your lender or whoever else you need to speak with. So I do recommend that particular form as a way of dealing with some of these issues. Once again, it's very important that people get their arms around their own financials and prioritize effectively. And I do notice that in some cases, we tend to see people grabbing more loans, be it credit card, debt, buy now, pay later, or other forms of credit. Uh, the truth is, of course, that adding more credit to the pile doesn't necessarily help at all because we cannot expect interest rates to come down very quickly. We can't expect rents to reset to lower levels. And so households are going to be in significant pressure for quite a long period of time. Therefore, it's worth taking the time to understand your financial position and to work out what to do to make better decisions. Look at paying off high interest rate debt first. Look also to prioritize your spending and uh, maybe cut back on streaming services and other things which are nice to have rather than need to have. Because in my surveys, I do see some people that are giving up on medical treatment or cutting back on food whilst they are still spending freely on things which frankly are nice to have rather than need to have. So there's a question of priority, which is important. Anyway, that brings me to the end of the first show with this rather sad warning. My expectation is that we are going to see stress continuing to rise in the months ahead. At the moment, there are very few settings that will help. Obviously, we're going to get some tax cuts that'll come through in July. And there is some government help, which is coming through, particularly around electricity costs and other things too. That may help at the margin. We're also expecting the next round of low paid work rises to come through. And that again may help too. But unfortunately, inflation is still burning quite bright. It's above what many people expected it would be. And that's putting more long term pressure on households. More people are also finding that their mortgages that were fixed are still turn turning to variable rates at higher than they expected and are in some difficulty. And we are seeing now more product listings in some places where people are being forced to get out while they can. So just to close this out now, the next show, we're going to drill in on the mortgage sector, particularly those owner occupiers and looking in more detail at mortgage stress. And we will look at individual postcodes and also some of the mapping for mortgage stress. So check back. The next show should be up in about 24 hours time. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.